Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kambiz Ranavadi, board member for Columbia, D.C., and a graduate of School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, first, I would like to thank our partners uh, and uh, for, for this evening, the Yale Club of Washington, D.C., and their members for joining us. Uh, we are very pri privileged to have Dr. Angus Fletcher, professor of story science at Ohio State University, to talk about uh, story thinking uh, and the new science of narrative intelligence, which is the title of uh, his most recent book published by Columbia University Press. Uh, we have sent uh, the uh, purchase link for this uh, great book, if you would like to purchase it. Um, uh, it is in our reminder uh, with a discount code, 20% off. Uh, but we will share it again uh, within 24 hours with the a link to the recording of this. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, our conversation this evening will be with our host, Carol Han, Strategic Communications and Humanitarian Information Division Chief at USAID. Uh, just to briefly introduce our uh, speaker, Speakers, um, Angus Fletcher is a professor of story science at the OSU's Project Narrative, and his uh, 2021 book, Wonder Works, the 25 Most Powerful Inventions in the History of Literature, talks about a generation of authors uh, whose innovative literature made uh, breakthroughs uh, that can help uh, uh, our brain process grief, recover from trauma, increase joy, and stimulate creativity. Um, his research has been published in uh, many uh, journals, including Harvard Business Review and Annals of the New York Academy of Science. And last but not least, our, our host, Carol Han, joined USAID after a career in broadcast journalism and has since uh, led several communications teams, um, as well as served as a press officer for more than 20 USAID-led disaster responses. Before that, uh, Carol worked as an Emmy Award-winning TV news correspondent and a reporter for almost 13 years, uh, most recently covering Capitol Hill and the White House for 11 local TV stations and uh, uh, three radio stations around the country. So without further ado, uh, Carol, sending it to you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Candice. And I'm so honored to be spending the next 90 minutes with you all unpacking this concept of story thinking. To give you all a roadmap of what's gonna be happening tonight, we're gonna to spend the first half of this chatting with uh, Professor Angus Fletcher about his book, Story Thinking. What is it? How does it make our lives better? After which we're going to ask you to join the conversation. You can ask questions in the chat box and we'll have that open to you all for the second half of the conversation. So Angus, I was actually thinking it would be apropos to start this conversation with maybe a story, so to speak. If I could read from page one of your book, you write, story, it's for communicating ideas, not producing them. Sure, story is capable of fantastical notions, but that's not real intelligence. Real intelligence is thinking critically, pushing past plausible anecdotes and beguiling fairy tales for true facts and enduring principles. Fiction, my teachers warned me, was dangerous because really fiction was another word for lie and rhetoric was worse. It's, it was lies that try to seem legitimate. Angus, your book really lays out a battle royale, if you will, between story and logic. And I would say stories get a bad rap and logic has a great PR machine, I feel like, you know, heralded by Aristotle. Could you lay this out, this kind of conflict between story and logic? Because I think it really underpins the concept of story thinking. Absolutely. So story we've all been told is just for communicating. That's the kind of big myth that I sort of try and take on in this book. And this is the myth that I was told when I was young. It's the myth that we've all been told. It's that if you want to convince people, if you want to persuade them, if you want to get them to do the things that you want them to do, you have to come up with the right story to tell them. And as I point out in the book, in fact, story is a lot older than communication. It's a lot older than language. It goes back before humans. Uh, and that's because it evolved in the brain as a way of thinking. And very simply, our brain largely evolved to think in plans and plots 
and strategies and it evolved to remember its own history and it evolved to imagine possible futures. And this way of thinking is so old that every animal in the world thinks this way. If you have a pet, they think in stories. Uh, if you even have a fish, they probably think a little bit in stories. And what I talk about in the book is we can uncover this power and we can uncover why it's something that computers don't have because computers can only think in logic. We can uncover why this power is both so extraordinary and so fragile. And we can, once we've uncovered that, and the kind of big pitch that I make in the book is we can unlock just a huge amount of potential in our educational institutions, in our jobs, in our regular lives. And one of the things I talk about a little bit towards the end of the book, and I'd be happy to talk about more here, is I work a lot with companies, I work a lot with schools, I work a lot with US Army, I work with all these different organizations on using stories to increase creativity, innovation, leadership, resilience, healing, uh, empathy, curiosity, I mean, all these kinds of wonderful things. So it's not just a kind of academic argument. Uh, it really is something that I think has a lot of practical force for the future of our lives. I think the issue, Angus, is that people don't think of storytelling and narrative as intelligence. Once again, story has gotten a bad rap. You said it here, like lies. We're making stuff up. Logic, on the other hand, has been something that's being like, ooh, that's a mark of intelligence. But what you lay out here are that there are limits to logic. Can you delve into that a little bit for us? Yeah, so the obvious limit to logic, which I think we're all going to discover over the next couple of years as the AI bubble bursts, is that logic requires lots and lots of data. And in order to have lots and lots of data, you need transparent and stable environments. So you need environments where tomorrow is the same as yesterday. Nothing changes. And when you have those kinds of environments, logic is very powerful, which is why logic is wonderful, for example, in logistics or why logic is wonderful in performing library functions because the contents of a book are never gonna change. But in any environment where there's the slightest bit of instability, what you have is data turning fragile and you also have data turning thin. So there's just not a lot of data. And in those instances, that's what story evolves for in the human brain. And what story allows you to do is it allows you to engage in various forms of low data intelligence of which a kind of Common example would simply be imagination. So imagination is low data, even no data. Uh, when you have like very limited stuff, you can just imagine all these futures. And that has gotten a bad rap, as you point out, over the last 30 years, because people have become obsessed with technology and data. And, you know, this idea that we can kind of achieve this perfect utopian world where nothing changes. But there's a reason why the most imaginative people in the world are children. And that's because to be a child is to have to operate with very little information. And yet children operate very, very successfully with very little information. We don't think of that, right? We, we have this kind of very negative view of children. Oh, these children, you know, look at all the mistakes they're making. But if you think about it, how extraordinary their successes are given the little that they know, and also the fact that children create the future constantly. So the world, all the kind of new, exciting things we have in our world, all of this comes about through adults either thinking like children or children thinking like children because they're able to see a future that doesn't exist yet because the data isn't there. So what I say in the book is that, you know, logic isn't bad, but in volatile, uncertain times, like the times we're living in now, we see its limits starkly exposed, and that has caused a lot of panic. And the way that panic often manifests itself is people retreat into what they think are the right answers. And they then turn story into an attempt to uh, brainwash other people into thinking like them. So story becomes a kind of propaganda engine. And, and I get you know, so many people asking me all the time, hey, Angus, could you tell me the perfect story to make people do what, they, what I want them to do? Could you give me the story that, that, that you know, makes my political campaign more successful or makes more people buy my product or you know, stops global warming? these kinds of things. And I say, that's not what story does. And it's a good thing too, because uh, what story does is it unlocks new actions, new possibilities. It's the basis of democracy. It's what allows us to come up with new answers to things like global warming. It's what allows us to be independent, free thinking, diverse, uh, all these kinds of things. And so 
that's the power of story. And what I walk through in the book is the science behind that. And I try and do it in an accessible way. I tell it through a series of stories, uh, which we can talk about a little bit if you'd like. Um, but you know, the main pitch of the book is that we're all born with this capacity and we just are not encouraged to use it very much anymore. And just by going back to the way we think naturally as children, by being more curious and diverse in the kinds of stories we consume, we can have a radically emancipatory effect on our own intelligence. According to your book here, it's really the magic of story and logic together that kind of really reinforces this concept of story thinking. Before I ask you to kind of explain that, I was wondering, I mean, reading in your book, you go into a bit of your past about uh, working at a Michigan neurophysiology lab, your past getting a PhD in literature at Yale, even your work on Hollywood. How did your background and all of those vast experiences, Angus, really help to undergird, if you will, your idea of story thinking? Yeah, so I often describe myself as a neuroscientist who went rogue. And so I got my start working in a neurophysiology lab. A neurophysiology lab is this wonderful, extraordinary place where you get to get down to the level of individual neurons. And you get to study the structure and function of these individual neurons and how they talk with each other. And um, you could say, you know, how does, how does one neuron influence the behavior of another neuron? All these kinds of sort of tiny, wonderful questions. And as I was there, I suddenly had this crisis. I had this crisis because I realized that working in that lab, the way that science was currently operating, I was never going to get a chance to answer the questions that I really wanted to ask. And the reasons for that were partly structural. Anyone who's ever worked in a science lab or a neuroscience lab knows that you're driven by funding. In order to kind of maintain funding, you've got to do the careful thing. You've got to uh, go for those grants by getting yourself on a kind of funding wheel. You've got to get a kind of core engine or method, and you've got to become the master of your kind of little domain. And that pushes hard against the possibility of doing really imaginative out of the box stuff. It's very hard. It's not impossible. Scientists do uh, imaginative work, but it's very hard institutionally. On top of that, I realized that in the lab that we, the way we were thinking about the brain was so limiting because we were really thinking about the brain as a sense-making machine. We were thinking about it as a symbolic logic processor. We were thinking about something that took in all this data from the senses and crunched that data to make rational choices which is to say we were thinking about it like a computer. And computers don't have imagination, computers don't have emotion, computers don't have all these other kinds of wonderful brain powers. And I wanted to understand those other brain powers. And so I, I had this sort of zany idea that I would leave the lab for a few years and I would go to Yale to study Shakespeare because I thought, who's more imaginative and who's, uh, you know, a bigger master of emotions than Shakespeare. So I'll just go to Yale English and I'll study Shakespeare for a few years and then I'll, I'll come back to the lab. And of course, I never made it back to that lab. I never made it back to that lab for a variety of reasons. The first of which was that Shakespeare was a lot more complicated than I as a scientist had thought. And I spent a lot of time at Yale being assured by the professors that you couldn't just put Shakespeare into a brain scanner and get quick answers to all these questions. And so I really had to dedicate myself to that. Um, but because I had this science background, I was asking questions about Shakespeare that no one had ever asked before. And I also was very lucky in that because I was trained as a young scientist, I started publishing like crazy. So I got to Yale when I was quite young and I started publishing immediately. And that meant that I was pretty much just about the only person in my class to survive, to get a job, because it's so hard as you might've heard nowadays to get a job in the humanities. And I ended up, my first, uh, my first job was an appointment uh, at the Humanities Institute at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I started asking these questions uh, because I was given the Shakespeare lecture. So if you can imagine this, I was standing up and sort of instructing all the, uh, the, uh, the, the Stanford undergraduates on, you know, King Lear and Hamlet and Anthony and Cleopatra and Twelfth Night. And um, I had this sort of very zany idea that what had made Shakespeare special was not that he told great stories. Um, or that he was the sort of perfect storyteller. I had this idea that what made him special was that he invented new stories. Because when you go through Shakespeare, what you realize is he's telling all these stories that haven't been told before. And you also realize that he's making them very successful. And I thought to myself, what an extraordinary thing to be able to invent new stories and then have audiences love them. 
And I thought that's kind of the secret to life, isn't it? If you could come up with new stories and have people like them, I mean, you could do anything, you know, uh, beyond being uh, a rich and famous screenwriter or playwright, you could become a very, very successful leader. Uh, you could run companies, you could do anything because if you can get people to buy into a new story, you can change the future. And so I wanted to know, how did he do that? And that was not really the kind of question you could ask in an English department at that time. So I picked up the phone and I called Pixar. And I made some wonderful connections there. And they let me into these secret vaults they have in the basement of Pixar, uh, which I'm going to kind of betray the secret of now. They're not a secret anymore. And in those secret vaults, they have all of the outtakes. They have all of the different versions of Toy Story and Up because they made those movies, not completely, but as flip books, often with actual actors. And you can see a version that has Tom Hanks doing Woody that was never released. And so I got to go through all these different versions of these movies, these famous movies, and I got to sort of study why was one version more effective than another? What were the differences in the way that the stories were working? And I started to develop this new way of thinking about story, which was very driven by Pixar. And the big thing is that I came to realize that even though most people in Hollywood believe that stories all had a universal structure, so if you're at Disney, you think everything has to be a fairy tale, so on and so forth. Other people believe in the hero's journey, so on and so forth. Pixar instead did this amazing thing where they started with what they want the audience to feel. And then they worked backwards to develop an original story that did that. And so simple example is up. What do you want the audience to do? You want them to go up. How do you do that? You work backwards to have a beginning that goes down. You know, I mean, all these kinds of things. So I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is because what this does is it frees up any kind of story. You don't have to be telling the same story over and over again. You can do anything you want. And so naturally, I moved from Stanford to the University of Southern California, and I moved into Hollywood, and I started consulting in Hollywood because I, I told everyone in Hollywood there's this amazing new way to think about stories, and it's, you know, and it's based in science, and, and we can tell all these new stories. And, of course, nobody in Hollywood listened to me because... You know, I mean, first of all, nobody in Hollywood has an attention span, but also, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, they, they know people like me. I'm a professor and I come from a university and what do we know about anything, right? You've probably met some professors. We're all, we have all these big ideas and they don't work. So I had to kind of hack my way into Hollywood by writing a screenplay that uh, won an award from the Academy for best first screenplay. And then after that, people wanted to hire me to write screenplays. And even though I didn't really like writing screenplays that much, I'll be honest. And then I got to meet a lot of people who worked in the industry and, and meet a lot of writers. And that allowed me to kind of study story more and, and do more work. And, and then I started working in other industries with story. And eventually I got recruited to Ohio State's Project Narrative, which I'm sure no one has ever heard of. But inside the Academy is known as the kind of like big think tank for people who really understand story. And so that's where I've spent the last eight years of my career. So with that background, could you explain to us, I mean, how would you define Angus story thinking, the part of your background that was in the lab, all of the experience that you've had in Hollywood and writing screenplays and in the vaults of Pixar. And I got to tell you, I balled it up. So they really do know how to play at the heartstrings. But put, bring that all together for us. What is story thinking? So story thinking is just simply your brain thinking in a story. I mean, it's just the word, as it says. I mean, the technical word for it is narrative cognition, but we might start by saying, what is a story? Uh, a story is just something that happens. Something that happens is an event, it's an action, it's a cause, it's a fact, it's one thing influencing another. And why is it that story evolves as a form of thinking in the human brain? I can tell you this story. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a story that takes us back 525 million years, the evolution of the neuron. We're swimming around in these Cambrian seas, which are just thick with new animal life. There's this explosion of new species, but there's also almost everything is dying because there's so much competition for life. And so there's this extraordinary moment where actually more species are going extinct than are evolving. So there's this terrible competition. There's this terrible fight for life in these ancient seas where the neuron first evolves. And so the neuron evolves to help those struggling creatures survive in two ways. The first thing it does, it helps them eat. And how do you eat? You see. And so the neuron develops this powerful ability to, to, to help animals see. 
And what that ability is, is the ability to take in information from the senses, crunch that information, process that information, find patterns in that information, think algorithmically. So in other words, vision is logic. It's this kind of computer process in the brain and it helps us eat other things. But eating other things wasn't the only thing that we needed to do. We also needed to avoid being eaten. <laughs> that was the other big thing you had to do to stay alive. And how did you do that? Well, you had to move in a way that the predators around you had never seen before. You had to create a new form of action. You had to act spontaneously and innovatively. And that was the other function that the neuron developed was this ability to come up with new actions, or in other words, new plots, new plans. And you see that ability, that kind of non-conscious motor ability, anytime you see an athlete on the field who suddenly moves in a way that they'd never moved before, dancers do this, surgeons do this. When a surgeon is working on a, on a, on a you know, on a kind of incision uh, where it's different from they've experienced before, their fingers will find a solution without them necessarily consciously thinking the solution, just because they're able to, to kind of create and find those new movements. And then that ability to invent new plots, new plans, slowly became conscious. We began to think in new plots, think in new plans, be aware of those new plans. And that's when we developed the ability to think back over our own life. So most of us spend a lot of our time thinking back over our past. We think, oh, I did this and I did that. And maybe I should have done this other thing and all these kinds of you know, ruminations on our history. But then we also spend a lot of time imagining forward. Oh, I'm gonna do this, or I'm gonna do that other thing. And even on a very basic level, when we're making plans for our day, we're constantly making these strategies and these plans. And when you go back and you see how you thought as a child, you were much more imaginative in those plans because you imagined yourself as a different person. You thought, oh, I'm not just me. I could be a knight or I could be a dragon or, you know, I could be my mom or I could be my dad or I could be my friend. And I'm gonna imagine the world differently and see different possibilities for action. And so that just enormous flexibility to think in story, and not just think in stories in terms of as they have occurred, but as they could occur. That is story thinking. Well, you just were talking about neurons. And in the book, you go into the bi biology of the brain and how our brain is really not necessarily made for logic, but as the argument you just made, it's for story thinking. Um, can we talk a little bit about our brain versus a computer? Because that's another kind of conflict. Conflict is kind of... Um, an interesting kind of theme also in this book, conflict between story and logic, conflict between our brain versus a computer. We'll get to artificial intelligence, AI in a moment, but I was kind of wondering if you could unpack that a little bit for us. You know, our brain, I think a lot of people think of our brain, we think of intelligence. If we were gonna play word games, brain, intelligence, logic, math, we don't necessarily think brain, stories. But you're making the argument in the book from the neurons to how our stories, are, our brains are mapped out that our brains are actually made for story narrative cognition and not necessarily for logic. Can you unpack that for us a little bit more, Angus? Sure. So let me, let me phrase it this way, because I think logic is good and story is good. So this isn't a claim that our brains never think in logic. Um, it's also not a claim that computers are bad because computers are better at logic than we are. They just have zero capacity of story. So just to be clear about that, a simple way to think about it might be that in terms of intelligence, logic has a very high floor and a very low ceiling, which is to say it's always doing what it perceives to be the optimum thing. And so it's always doing the same thing. Story has a very, very low floor and a very, very high ceiling. And so this is why story makes a lot of people nervous because if you've ever been around somebody who tells a lot of stories, who thinks a lot of stories, who is imaginative, who is a child or a creative, they have a tendency to come up with zany ideas that you're like, whoa, that would never work. You know, this seems very dangerous. Let's go back to logic because we wanna raise that floor and not do anything too wacky. But on the other hand, almost everything extraordinary in this world has come from story thinking. It's come from imagining a future that didn't exist yet. And that of course is obvious in the arts, but it's also completely the case in technology and science. And I walk through this in the book. So, I mean, very simple examples are the invention of the rocket ship. It was imagined, I mean, most sort of amazing technology we have were imagined by people before they were built. It's also the case of scientists. I talk about how Darwin, how Einstein, how Marie Curie, all of them were story thinkers. All of them went from a kind of single piece 
of information, not like a huge amount of information, went from a single piece of information and then we're able to jump to these hypotheses. I talk about in the book, like the myth of modern science is the myth of induction. So there's this idea that computers and AI can do science because science just involves getting huge amounts of facts and then synthesizing them to find the truth. That's not how science actually works. That's how Francis Bacon thought that science worked in the 16th century, but then someone called, called John Herschel came along. And I tell John Herschel's story. John Herschel studied more stars than anyone in history. He understood, he had more data points than anyone in history. And he was unable to come up with a single new idea based on all of that. And he went back to study Copernicus. And he said, you know, why is it that I have all this data, but I can say nothing new? What did Copernicus do? And he realized that Copernicus used just a couple pieces of, of information and jumped from them imaginatively to make these predictions, which he then tested. And it's that process of story thinking, of taking a few pieces of data, jumping forward, testing, experimenting, coming back, making a new jump, as opposed to a big data process of inducting and trying to work your way up to truth that allows for that high ceiling. It allows you to go beyond the data. It allows you to go beyond logic and create things that couldn't exist otherwise. So that's the kind of big thing. And then what I really want to emphasize in the book is that even though this is a born capacity that we all have to think in story, it's being discouraged by a lot of modern life. Uh, a lot of modern life is discouraging story thinking. Our schools are discouraging it. I work a lot in schools. Um, it's been known for years that schools are making kids drastically less creative. And the less creative that they get, the less resilient that they get, the less able they are to solve their own problems and the problems of the world. It's been known that this continues all the way through graduate school. Um, you know, by the time you're getting your PhD in engineering, you're less creative than you were when you were in kindergarten. It's also known that workplaces are discouraging thinking in story. Um, but you can build simple, straightforward classes and exercises that do the reverse, that tap into this power, that don't destroy logic, that exist alongside logic. And, and I've been fortunate to do that, as I talk about a little bit in the book, um, with some you know, big companies. I do it with US Army Special Operations. I do it with doctors. And the reason I highlight those examples is because those are all people who have to be smart. You don't want to go in and have your doctor suddenly do something zany. Uh, you don't want, um, you know, Delta Force to suddenly do something zany. Uh, you want them to be intelligent. And the fact that we can run these training exercises on them, the fact that we can kind of put them back in touch with their childlike powers of story thinking, and it makes them smarter at their jobs, shows that I think all of us could, if we wanted to, get back to that kind of lost source of intelligence in our own heads. Let's go back a little bit, Angus, to schools. And if I could really uh, read really briefly from your book, um, you write first, we as humans will never outcompute computers. Their silicon circuits are already better at logically crunching data than we will ever be. So why devote the bulk of our school time to setting up future generations to be second class algorithms. And I wrote here on the side, like, LOL, ask Angus about this. But Angus, you go into this a little bit. I mean, we're never going to outcompute computers. And yet computers cannot make uh, leaps and causal speculation that humans can. So why do we, what's wrong with our educational system? I mean, you go into common core here. Where do you, we're talking about this a little bit just now, but where do schools fall short, in your opinion? Well, it's just like you said. So basically, over 90% of what is trained in schools now is some form of logic. And so, you know, memorization, math, critical thinking, all of these are forms of logic. And there's nothing wrong with logic except for the fact that we've built a machine that does logic better than we do. So why are we training our kids to do this kind of stuff? I mean, when I was in school, I remember we had the emergence of the first graphing calculators. And all this kind of stuff. And we were always like, why are we still learning how to graph things by hand when we have this device? And our teachers would be like, you know, when, when your calculator breaks and you have to make a graph. And I was like, will we? You know, um, I'll never, I never have had to do that. Right. No, I've never had to do that either. You know, and, and at a certain level, it's, it's sort of like saying, well, if you don't learn how to walk to work, you're going to regret it when your car breaks. 
It's like, no, we, we've built this technology to do these things for us. Let's allow the technology to do it for us. So, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is by putting all this emphasis on logic, we're not training our brains to do the things that only we can do. We're not training our brains to have imaginative answers to big problems. We're also not training our brains to have imaginative answers to small problems. So, so many kids today, they can't figure out how to solve their daily relationship struggles, their struggles with their parents, um, career crises. As a result, we're seeing these rise in anger, in anxiety, in dependence, going to adults for help. You know, oh, can you help me with my problem? They're not able to solve their own problems, but they can because it's in their head. And the reason that I single out the common core is because the common core does this thing where it reduces stories to language. Mm -hmm. And so we have this thing as a result of the common core known as the language arts. And that's where you will study theater, that's where you will study poetry, that's where you will study novels, that's where you study comics, all these, they fall under the language arts. And you might say, well, Angus, what's wrong with that? Yeah, sounds good. Sounds great, right? You know, language. Every time I talk to someone, everyone, every time I tell someone that I study Shakespeare, they say, oh, his language is so beautiful. Language is logic. Language is a symbolic system. It gave us things like semiotics, which is what computers do. Computers interpret texts. And we have been trained for the last hundred years to read plays, poems, comics, all these things like computers read them. We've been taught to do things like close reading and interpretation which is fine, there's nothing wrong with that, but computers can do it better and faster than we can do it, um, which is one of the reasons I will say that humanities is now collapsing, is because people are realizing that they're not being taught things in there that can't be done by something else better. But why not take all those stories and use them to do what we do with them as children, which is to imagine, which is to create. One of the first experiences we have as a child when we pick up a book and we start to read is a sudden ability to see things that don't exist yet. So when you pick up a story, you will immediately say, oh, well, what would happen if this character did this thing? Or what would happen if I lived inside this world? And you start to do these things. And then the more your brain starts to do these things, the more you realize that's what a business person does. A business person <laughs> imagines a world that doesn't, or a technologist. They imagine something that doesn't exist yet and they figure out how to make it true. Same thing with a scientist, same thing. With, these are those kinds of powers. Those are the kinds of things we naturally get from, from reading stories. Why don't we do more of those kinds of things in school? And stories also help us do something else, which is really important, which kids don't do in school, which is process their emotions. Emotions are now considered because of the rise of logic, these like inconvenient, stupid things. So I'm constantly being told by people, well, you know, if we could only get rid of emotions, there's this obsession in our modern culture with mindfulness and pop stoicism as a way of just getting rid of emotion. Oh, we have to somehow dissociate from it. You know, there must be something wrong with emotion. Emotion is a really incredible, powerful form of intelligence, which allows and informs our brain of all kinds of things. So if you feel grief, that's telling you you haven't gone through and processed a loss in your life and you need to go back and you need to process that. If you feel fear, it's because you have no plan. Our brain feels fear when it has no plan. Why does it feel fear when it has no plan? Well, because fear makes you more susceptible to other people's plans. And because in life, you always need a plan. And once you understand that about your emotions, you can say to yourself, oh, do I wanna take on somebody else's plan? Do I wanna be scared? Or do I wanna actually figure out how to invent my own plan so that instead of just going with the herd, I figure out my own way to solve this problem. And so these are all these things that we could use stories to teach in schools to help students become more happy and effective in their lives. But we are not doing that because we are teaching the common core and we are teaching language arts and we are essentially teaching logic and computer thought. So what are you saying, Angus? Get away with standardized testing and let's do some more kind of like reading stories in a narrative way and not, you know, taking them apart symbolically and interpreting them? Well, I would love to do that. And that's what we have done. So first of all, I want to be clear, I don't want to get rid of standardized tests for math or for other areas where they're helpful and important, but we've done a lot of work where we've gone into schools, and I publish this work, it's available if people are interested, we've gone into schools as young as third grade, and we've given them this new kind of narrative training, and we've shown that even over a short period of time, it dramatically increases their self-efficacy, so their belief in themselves, it dramatically increases their resilience, 
And it also increases their practical imagination or their practical creativity. One of the things that always happens when I go into school and I talk about stories and imagination is people say, oh, yeah, it'd be great if kids did more finger painting. And, I'm, and I say, no, 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 no. I mean, that is great. But what's really great is if kids can invent solutions to hard problems. And you don't do that through design thinking. You don't do that through divergent thinking, which is another computer logic process. You do that through narrative thinking. And so the curriculum is there, we've built it. Um, you know, the National Councils of Teachers of English has endorsed this training and we're gonna to start to kind of push it through schools. And we've also, one of the reasons I've partnered with the US Army, which people often find somewhat curious considering the fact that um, I don't like guns and don't know how to use them, um, is because the US Army has used this training to teach its frontline soldiers to be more creative, more imaginative, more effective at solving practical problems. And the US Army has independently validated the training and shown that it works. So yes, there is a curriculum that we could start to plug in schools right away, which would have these kinds of positive effects. And all it really takes is, um, you know, the appetite to try something new. I want to make a little bit of a pivot here because I really want to ask you about artificial intelligence. And I'm fully going to admit here that I'm scared of singularity. I mean, that's the moment, that fateful moment where artificial intelligence surpasses human creators. Um, I mean, there are movies made about this, right? Terminator and Skynet and The Matrix. Uh, but you say in your book, don't worry about it. AI will never surpass Artificial intelligence will never surpass narrative intelligence or even human intelligence. Why not? Yeah, no, this is this is true. I mean, first of all, um, the idea of AI taking over is a great story. So it's something that humans can imagine, but that AI can't. So you don't have to worry. No AI will ever itself come up with the story of AI. I should also say, because I get enormous skepticism about this, and um, I'm very comfortable with that skepticism, but... I work a lot in AI. I have a long history working in AI. I was brought in years ago to do all sorts of kind of specific stuff on LLMs and NLPs. I currently run an AI startup, which is quite highly valued. So I'm not anti-AI in the sense that I, I don't think that it's useless, but I do think that it's largely a bubble. And the important thing is to understand that AI and computers in general just think differently than humans do. They think by using massive amounts of information, and then they essentially just kind of recycle or blend or mix and match that information uh, to come up with stuff. Whereas humans are capable of imagining new actions, new things to do. So the first thing is AI thinks differently currently than humans do. So there's nothing indicative of current AI that it's gonna go Skynet. Then the bigger claim that I make in the book and I walk through this in a non-technical way. If you're interested in more technical proofs, I have them out there that are published. But if I walk through it in a non-technical way, I explain that there's a core hardware difference hmm. between computers and humans. And I tell the story of this guy, John Eccles, who's the person who invented, the, who, who discovered the synapse. The synapse is this, is this wonderful gap in between neurons. And for a long time, scientists in the mid 20th century thought that the synapse, that this gap, functioned essentially like a transistor. And without being too technical about it, uh, a transistor is a kind of semiconductor. And what people thought was that charge came down the neuron and that it had to build up to a certain point and then it would just leap over the gap. And, and it would be this kind of on-off thing. And Eccles himself believed this. And then he ran this experiment which proved otherwise. It proved that in fact, that the gap there was this physical mechanism made up of chemicals or proteins that was actually uh, communicating the information. It was not an electronic circuit. Why is that important? Well, that's important because if the brain operated electronically, it would need to operate according to the laws of design. Mm. If you have an electronic thing that doesn't operate according to the laws of designs, it will either just fry or short circuit if you, if you kind of randomly improvise it or it just won't work. But if what you have in the brain is a series of self-contained wires, each of which creates their own electricity. So you don't have a continuous electricity source from outside, but each of them is self-powered, but they're connected physically, mechanically. They can improvise these connections of this leads to that. So this neuron leads to that neuron. What is this leads to that? 
that is a story. That is this action causes this action. And so your brain is this huge improviser in its hardware of possible plots, plans, stories, story thinking. And it couldn't do that if the synapse was electronic. So that's just a simple example. There's many, many other kinds of technical explanations, but the main point is, is that the hardware of the human brain is just different. And if you talk to any neuroscientist, they will assure you that a neuron is much more complicated than a transistor. And that complexity is not the result of some kind of giant biological error. Because as we've already talked about, vision and computation evolved hundreds of millions of years ago. So if the brain wanted to be a transistor, it could be. It's chosen to do otherwise because it wants to be smarter. So AI will never take over. It's not just a software issue. It's a hardware issue. Uh, AI cannot think in stories because it cannot think in stories. It can't plot. It can't plan. There's never going to be a plan to take over the world. None of these things are ever going to happen. We're living in the middle of an AI bubble. Remember this in three years when we're talking about LLMs like they're the next crypto. Um, they have some interesting limited functionality. Smart people will figure out smart things to do with them, uh, use them as a tool, but they do not think. They rearrange words. I guess I could talk about AI all day, but let me ask you one last question before we start opening it up to for others to join the conversation. And please feel free to start dropping in. I see some questions in the chat box. I'll be getting to those uh, very quickly, but let me ask you one last question from my end. So you've laid out this argument for story thinking, the way that our brains, our biology is behind it, the neurons and synapses, why AI will not take over the world, why we need to mesh both logic and narrative. So how do we get better at it? Yeah, so I give a few basic tips in the book, um, which we can walk through. The first thing uh, that I love to emphasize is, is leaning into the exceptional. And what I mean by that is logic is all about abstracting. It's all about finding similarities. It's all about finding generalities. But narrative is all about finding what's specific, what's unique. That's why whenever you write a story, you're always trying to find what is special about this character? What's unique about that? But you always lean into those elements. And the longer we go in our world, the more we think in generalities. And those generalities lead us to make snap judgments of people. We say, oh, he's a that, or oh, she's a this, you know? Whereas children have this infinite curiosity because they're always noticing little pieces of information, little details. And so a lot of the basic work that I do with companies, a lot of the work that I do with um, the military is to go in and put two apparently identical things in front of them and be like, what's different? What's exceptional? What's unique? And the more in your daily life you can focus on saying, what's unique about this? What's special about this? Because that activates your curiosity and then your empathy and then your imagination. The more you're going to the more you're going to activate story thinking. So that's one simple tip: the exceptional. A next thing I, I say to people, which is more challenging but equally fruitful, is try to lean more into conflict. Try to lean more into tension. Oh, we're, people don't like that. No, people do not like that. We live in a world where everyone's very tension averse and very conflict averse. Every story begins with a conflict. This is another basic lesson of writing. You can't write a story that doesn't have a conflict in it. You need to have a real conflict, a real tension. This is why trying to use stories to brainwash people doesn't really work because there's never any tension in your stories. You have to uncover something that makes people go, oh my goodness, that's a real conflict. That's a real tension. I don't know what's going to happen. And the same thing in your own life, if you can identify tension and conflict and lean into it, not to try and eliminate one side or the other or choose which is better or synthesize or compromise, but lean into the tension and say, what is this gonna create? What is this gonna produce? Where could we go from here? Many of your most productive friendships, you have conflict. Many of your most productive relationships, you have conflict. And you learn to take that conflict as a source of growth. So the next thing I always say is learn to be comfortable with conflict, try and get into relationships where you can be open and honest about conflict, and then lean into it, not try and come up with quick solutions. Um, the final thing as a tip is read more diverse stories. Hmm. So all of us get into this kind of rut where it's like, I like detective fiction. I like romances. I like sci-fi. I like this. I like that. I have my favorite author, you know, and then you, we just read tons and tons and tons of that. That's totally fine as an entertainment activity, but if you want to grow your story thinking, you want to read stories that are different, that are challenging to you. 
And to put in a plug for the book, uh, this is why the book is constructed in these stories. Uh, if you choose to read the book, um, you might be like, Angus, why are you telling me these very complicated stories? Why aren't you just coming up with simple stories that communicate exactly what you're saying? And if you want to know exactly what I'm saying, you can just read the first chapter and then read the coda and it explains everything. The purpose of these stories as you go through the book is they become more complicated. They have more characters in them. They have more plot twists in them. And what that does, you'll discover as you start to read them is first of all, it will stimulate imagination because it'll put your brain under pressure and you will suddenly start thinking of these other things. And that's what happens when you read stories that are different or unusual. And the other thing that will happen is your brain will say, oh, how can I hold this story together? Because the stories in the book are short, but they're quite complicated. And you know it's a little puzzle for your brain. How can I see the beginning to the end of each chapter? How can I get the beginning to the end of each story? When you do that, suddenly you'll have an aha moment and your brain will have learned a new story. And once it's learned that new story, it has it forever and it can take it with it and use it to solve problems. So the book is built as a kind of obstacle course, as a kind of training experience to literally give you the experience of story thinking and to kind of bulk that up. But if you don't want to read the book, just get stories that are different from the ones you normally read by maybe asking a friend or someone else, hey, what's a book that you like? If you start reading it and you hate it, that's a good sign that it's a different kind <laughs> of story. Keep going. Angus, I really enjoyed our conversation. Let's bring others in. Uh, let me uh, and have them part of this conversation. We have someone who wrote, um, since humans have only been writing and working on logic for a relatively short time, do we think that storytelling is the basis of the way so much of the past is known through stories? Yeah. So if you want me to give you a quick history of logic, first of all, I do want to be honest and say that informally, people have been doing both story and logic for a very long time. That's because they're both natural processes in the human brain. But really, logic starts to take over around 350 BCE when Aristotle writes this book called The, called the Organon, or as we now know it, The Organon. And that becomes um, this place where all of formal logic is gathered together. It becomes the most influential work in medieval philosophy. And then later, it becomes the basis of the computer. What Aristotle goes through very quickly in that book is he starts by talking about hermeneutics or interpretation. So anytime you've ever interpreted a book or done any kind of critical thinking, that comes from Aristotle. He then goes through the laws of the syllogism, which he says are and or nots. Those three rules are compressed in the modern computer into NAND nor logic gates, which mm. are the only logic gates the computers use. So Aristotle invented the computer, invented AI. And then finally, Aristotle goes on to talk about things like dialectic. So Aristotle invented Hegel and Marxism and continental philosophy. So all of this logic, pretty much almost anything you've done in the humanities, in any class, in your lifetime, comes from Aristotle's organon. It's all there. It's rediscovered over different generations, whether that's by um, sort of monks in the Middle Ages, whether it's rediscovered by Hegel, or whether it's rediscovered by modern AI uh, processors, but that's where that all comes from. And to the readers, to the audience's question, yes, prior to that, the humanities were not logic-based. They were story-based. So for example, philosophy was largely wisdom literature. It was advice passed on from generations about here's what happened when I did this, or here's my advice for that. And if you go through and you read ancient, law, uh, ancient philosophy books, they're very open and inclusive. And they're not sort of synthesized into a, a kind of single life view. There's a kind of diversity there. I talk about that a little bit in the book. Same thing with literary stories. We now live in this world, thanks to Joseph Campbell, where people are obsessed with the idea of finding the monomyth and like the universal story that, that, that connects everything. And if you go back to ancient myths, people aren't trying to find the universal myth. They're retelling the same myth. So over and over and over again, the same story is being retold again and again and again and again in, in different ways. So yes, story did tend to dominate probably more in culture and the humanities uh, prior to Aristotle and prior to the modern humanities. And it continues to be the opportunity for us outside the humanities in kind of ordinary folk storytelling, folk history, and folk philosophy. I want to get to Joseph Campbell and Lloyd's question in a moment, but just as a add-on to that, like um, the one of the other questions that came is, 
when do we think um, humanoids or predecessors started story thinking? I think you hit upon that a little bit, Angus, but anything more to add as to when we started story thinking and thinking in this way? Okay, so uh, this is a kind of open question because no one can say for sure because we can't go back in a time machine. But so first of all, we know that we story think and we know that we do that because we make plans and plots. What else makes plans and plots? Crows and other kinds of birds. When you take birds and you take humans and you go back to common ancestors, you start to get back to the time and before the time of the dinosaurs. So we're talking hundreds of millions of years is when story thinking evolved. And story thinking means consciously thinking in story. It means the awareness that you're thinking in story. What we might call motor intelligence, which is kind of, or moto, motor intelligence, which is just the ability to come up with new actions, that goes back maybe 500 million years, it's hard to know, but way, way, way to the beginning of animal life before anything was, was, was walking on land. Lloyd asks, and you also brought this up, um, the complaint I hear is that Hollywood films are too predictable, agreed. Too much the same story, too much the same formula. We were talking just now about the short list of immortal formulas. Um, so, but the formula is based on what worked on audiences. Any solution, I would add no more sequels, Angus. Like what's the solution here? It's like the same story being told over and over. It yeah. makes a lot of money though. Well, it did make a lot of money. And I think what we have to understand is that Hollywood is in a crisis. I can say this, I'm a WGA member. You know, I, I write stuff, you know, I work a lot with writers. We're in a crisis now where we need new stories. Audiences want new stories. It's healthy for societies to have new stories. So first of all, there's just a kind of imperative to find these new stories. And as I've already talked about, the Pixar method is a great way of doing that. Um, I don't want to keep like shilling my own stuff, but I have a, a thing on Amazon people can go and look at where I walk through kind of how stories work in terms of movies. I show how 12 great movies that people think are hero's journey are not in fact hero's journey stories. So there's always been a kind of diversity in storytelling in Hollywood, even though it keeps convincing itself that it's telling the same story over and over again. So the main thing is get writers empowered. Allow writers to tell the kinds of stories that they want to tell. Go out to different cultures. Cultures tell stories differently. Go out and bring in more of those stories and start using those to tell stories. So there's a huge wealth out there. The analogy I would simply use is, is, is trees in the forest or biology in general. Life always likes to branch. Hmm. So you can find that branching if you just get out of your house. If you just sit in your house looking out the window, everything looks the same as it did yesterday. If you go out into the forest, and it's the same thing with stories. Go out, listen to stories from other cultures, read stories from history. The Greeks did not actually use the hero's journey. So there's plenty of models out there that would make storytelling more interesting. And on Joseph Campbell, we should remember that this theory essentially is has to the end of the 19th century uh, by the British Empire as an attempt to prove that all nations are telling the same story, which culminates in the British Empire. So there's a very sort of self-interested motive behind, and, and it's the same sort of self-interested motive, I think, that, 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 that you know, exists in Hollywood, which is like, we exist as the pinnacle of all storytelling. Um, you might invent a new story tomorrow that no one has heard before. Your child might invent a new story tomorrow that no one has heard before. Um, and again, by just encouraging that kind of natural process, uh, uh, we'll get there. Angus Tara writes, I'll ask the obvious question. Can you please give some guidance and some examples of how to use story thinking in everyday life? What are the techniques? How does it work? Actually, great question, Tara. Yeah, so, um, the first thing to go back a little bit to what I was saying before is try and focus as much as you have the energy for on what is unique about the people in your lives and what is unique about the situations that you find yourself in. Because when you think in a logic based way, you're always attempted to come to the fastest general abstract answer. So if in your life you are moved rapidly to judgment or anger or any of these emotions, that's a sign that you're thinking in logic. If you're thinking in story, you're thinking what's different, what's distinct, that activates 
curiosity, which activates empathy, which activates imagination. So the first and most basic thing is don't judge. Hmm. Uh, try and treat everyone as special. So, so that's one kind of basic um, you know, piece, of, piece of advice that I like to give. Um, the other thing that I say is um, make a lot of plans. So this is a basic thing that I do all the time when I go in and I work with businesses or I work with third graders or I work with special operations is I say, keep making lots of different plans. Don't try and find the optimum plan. Always imagine what different thing could happen. And the more you're making those different plans, the more you're just getting your brain in the habit of planning. And so what we always say is planner, not the plan. Our modern world likes to emphasize the plan, likes to come up with the perfect plan, then likes to come up with the plan B, the perfect optimum plan. If you instead emphasize the planner, then when things change, you're already there because you're used to making plans. You're used to planning. So another thing is to get in the habit of planning. And if you have a child, the exercise I love to run the most is what we call backwards forwards. So backwards forwards means that when you encounter a problem, you step back and say, why does this matter to me? What am I trying to accomplish? And then you try and step forward in a different way. So that instead of just trying to walk forward again and again and again into the problem, you step back, say why, and then say, what if, and go around. So, okay. I we have. To, I like that. I'm an experiential learner. So let's say I'm your child and I'm like, I'm being bullied at school. How do we do backwards forwards with that? Okay. Yeah. Right. Someone made fun of me. Yeah. That's so we the say, problem. So we say, you know, um, why do you care? Why do you care? Why does it matter that someone bullied you? What's the, you know, what's the problem? You know, it hurts my feelings. It hurts feelings. Well, why, why do you, um, why do you want to have positive feelings? What kind of positive feelings do you want to have instead? I want to, I want people to like me. You want people to like you. Okay. Well, what are ways that you can get people to like you? What are things that people around you like? What are things that people like it when you do? Okay. That's, and then you kind of delve into that a little bit more. It's a lot of inquiry then and curiosity. Yeah. I mean, the simple example that we often run with kids as a starter example is we, we run them through less intense examples than that because that's a really <laughs> challenging thing to solve. So we, we run them through what we call two-act problems. And so a kind of typical two-act problem is that Jane wants to build a sandcastle, but it rains. And so the kids are like, oh, Jane wants to build a sandcastle, but it rains. And then we say, okay, why do you think Jane wants to build a sandcastle? What could be going on there? And then kids will say things like, well, you know, maybe she wants to build a castle or maybe she wants to make something with her hands, or maybe she wants to create something that she can destroy. And then we say, okay, well, what are different ways that you can make a castle? Oh, well, you can make a castle inside with blocks. Okay, or what's a different way that you can make something with your hands? Oh, you could get some clay and you can make a pot. Oh, okay, well, what's a different way that you could create something that you destroy? Oh, you can make a cupcake and you could tear it apart with your fingers. So those are sort of sort of starter examples of getting kids to go backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. And anytime, you know, we encounter a problem in our house, we do this with our kids. We, we say, okay, well, why is this a problem? Why is it so important for you to be liked? You know, what, you know, why does that matter to you? You know, they say, oh, because this, and then it starts them starting to realize I don't just have to keep banging my head in this direction. I can start to open up and the answers don't appear immediately. But that's okay because that's where creativity lies. Creativity lies in the sense of openness, whereas logic is about tell me the answer, the right answer now. X equals Y. Yeah. John writes, I'm curious as to whether there has been any creative social science research on the following. Do creative people or logical people have greater longevity? Oh, you mean who lives longer in life? I, I mean, let's say, yeah. I mean, is there any research? And then as an add-on to that, like, are there benefits? You know, are there additional benefits when it gets to life or um, quality of life when it comes to story thinking? Thanks for that so, question, John. Yeah, so I'm required to say that none of us are logical and none of us are creative, even though I understand the point of the question and even though I acknowledge that it's true that some people uh, are usually in their lives more logical and other people are more creative. Uh, but I, it's part of my job to say we all have the capacity to do both. Um, so creatives are high variance. 
What does that mean? That means the creatives tend to be both more successful and less successful than logicals. So you can figure out what that means in terms of life. Uh, that means the creatives take greater risks. So creatives overall either experience a lot more satisfaction or a lot less satisfaction. And um, this is also the case that um, creatives in general uh, experience more resilience and less resilience. Why do they experience more resilience? Well, they experience more resilience because they're always able to come up with something new. But they experience less resilience because a lot of times their creativity turns into magical thinking, and just imagining that things were otherwise in wish fulfillment. And so you get this kind of very big variance. And what we like to do is we like to try and work with teams so that we can all get the benefits uh, without having to get the drawback. So if you're just an individual and you have to choose between being logical and creative and being creative, that's a hard choice, right? I mean, you know, do you want to have like the sure thing or do you want to risk it, you know, and maybe get a lot, or maybe get a little, right? But if you're in a team, you get both and you get both in the team because logic provides the floor. you got the logical person who's got like the safe backup plan and the creative who's taking the risks. And then I say to people, your brain can be a team. Hmm. Your brain can be multiple people. You can be very creative and very logical at the same time. And one of the things we work a lot with executives and special operators is developing what we call the switch. And the switch is toggling back and forth rapidly between logic and creativity. So if you're in a stable environment, which is transparent and tomorrow and yesterday are the same, be logical. Be very logical. There's no point in wasting time being creative, you know? I mean, as you might tell, I always wear the same shirt. Why? Because this, the same shirt always works. It's never, it's never let me down, you know? I'm not in a job where my shirt matters. So why bother being creative, right? I'll just be logical there. But if you're in a place of high volatility or high uncertainty, suddenly things are changing at work. Suddenly things are changing in your relationship. Suddenly there's been, been, been a shock or a loss of normal rules, switch over, the benefit of being creative is much higher in that environment because even though creativity doesn't work, logic is never going to work. So you're already increasing your odds. And second of all, once you start leaning into creativity, you can continue being more creative. So creativity is always giving you new options. So what I always like to tell people is you don't have to choose. Instead, develop the switch. When you develop the switch, you get both options. If developing the switch is hard for you, make friends with somebody who is your opposite. I just wrote that down, toggling. I think this dovetails really well into John Peacock's question. Um, what about training a doctor in story thinking? Um, do you think that can happen? Can this improve their diagnostic acumen? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, so first of all, this is something we do all the time. We train both um, diagnosticians and we train surgeons. And story thinking is beneficial in different ways. So the first thing that has to be said is that AI is terrible at making diagnoses. It's terrible at making diagnoses. It gets all this information and it is highly wrong. <laughs> uh, humans, doctors, when you work with them, they're much more accurate with much less information, but they tend to get nervous because they're in these systems where they have to make sure they've run all these tests and all these, the, you know, followed all these flow charts and so on and so forth. And so what we spend a lot of time in healthcare systems showing is that actually the system is more effective if you allow doctors, trained doctors, experienced doctors to develop their, what the doctors like to call their intuitions, but what I would call their story thinking. So absolutely, you can train doctors to do this. They can get much more effective at doing it. And by story thinking, they also get much more effective at building a bond with patients. One of the major things we see happening in the healthcare system is there's just a huge loss of trust. And that loss of trust is producing all sorts of negative outcomes. First of all, on the side of the doctor, it's producing a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. They have to deal with a lot of anger, uh, rage. Nurses are having to deal with patients who basically don't trust the system, who have self-diagnosed by going on the internet, all these kinds of negative things. You know. Then on the flip side, on the patient side, you get much less better care if you don't trust your doctor. Hmm. Now, that's not because your doctor is always right. But that's because if your doctor isn't right, get a second opinion. In other words, go to another doctor. Don't stop listening to your doctor. What, what creates uh, effective care is a patient who trusts the system, who trusts the doctors, and who has this feeling that they can tell the doctors what they're feeling and listen. How do you build that trust? 
You build that trust through empathy and curiosity by treating every patient as though they're unique. So if as a doctor, you come into the room and the first thing you do is you notice something unique about the patient that's positive and you say, hey, that's a wonderful thing about you, that person will suddenly start to trust you more because they'll be like, hey, this doctor is treating me like an individual. Yeah. Just diagnosing me like a kind of bag. So you're building that trust. And then the more you kind of maintain that kind of story thing. So even outside of diagnosis, simply in patient interaction, making that effort to treat everyone as an individual has a huge effect on patient care. And, you know, to make myself unpopular, I work a lot in these healthcare systems where people are obsessed with efficiency, lean Six Sigma, weight, mm -hmm. all these kinds of things. And on paper, it looks like we're making hospitals so much better because, hey, look, patient wait time is down. Everybody hates it. Everyone is alienated. And it's because we're emphasizing efficiency over effectiveness. Mm. And, and they are not the same thing. And they are not the same thing. Yeah. And, and what story thinking does is it allows you to tap into that natural human connection. Logic, Lean Six Sigma, these are built for industrial processes like building cars. Humans are not a car. You don't fix a human the way you fix a car uh, or you know, build a refrigerator. And so what we need to do is I think in the same way we need to turn more power over to teachers in schools. I think we need to turn more power over to doctors in hospitals. And what that means is trusting more in individual human intelligence and deprioritizing sort of systemic logical intelligence. But anyway, that's something beyond my power to affect, but yes, story thinking can help doctors. And yes, Trisha writes, could you explain in greater detail what you see as distinctions between design thinking and story thinking when developing solutions to real life problems? And in what ways is story thinking perhaps more valuable for innovating new solutions? Thanks for that question, Tricia. No, this is a great question. And so just a couple of things I'll say about design thinking. Uh, I'm not an opponent of design thinking when it comes to troubleshooting existing processes. It's great at kind of what is technically called minor innovation. So if you're looking to kind of um, sort of streamline or refine or fine tune, I think design thinking is what you want. It doesn't lead to major innovation. It doesn't lead to kind of big leaps. It doesn't lead to big breakthroughs. Why? Well, um, first of all, design thinking always starts by defining the problem. This is what you do. You define the right What problem are we trying to solve? That's not how story operates. Story, story, story starts with no idea of what the problem is. Story starts by leaning into a conflict, into a tension. Uh, and that leaning into that tension or that conflict is what produces these kinds of big imaginative leaps. So to start with, story just operates on a kind of totally different initial step. Then design thinking proceeds into what it likes to call empathy, but is really trying to define an ideal user. When you define an ideal user, how is that empathy? That's generalizing and coming up with a sense of this is what humans are. That's again, a kind of computer thing. Whereas what story thinking is doing is story thinking is saying, no, what's unique, what's sp sp specific, what is unprecedented about this situation. And finally, design thinking thinks of story as a way to communicate. So I work a lot with designers who are like, once you come up with a design, you come up with a story that packages the two or three pieces of data that programs people to think like you think. In other words, you're designing their mind. And in reality, you get your most effective breakthroughs by co-creating with other people. So instead of using story as a way to program your target audience or your consumer, instead going to them and listening actively uh, by doing what we often call active questioning, uh, that causes tension, conflict, which then produces the innovation. So there's nothing wrong with design thinking as a form of troubleshooting, but yes, there are more effective, more natural ways of doing major innovation. Lionel asks, could you please discuss how story interacts with human memory? and can be used to enhance memory, including related science research, et cetera. Any connections there, Angus? Yeah, well, I wanna to be uh, totally honest and say that I'm not an expert in the field of memory, but I will say that story is generally something that humans recall more than we recall facts or information. Uh, and so a lot of times, and this is a sort of a famous thing, if you, if you ask someone what happened, all the details will be wrong, but the story will be right. 
you know, they'll, they'll, they'll remember. And that's because a huge part of what's happening there is our brain has good recall of that story. So story can be effective of remembering an action. It can be effective at remembering an activity. It's not necessarily particularly reliable at remembering individual pieces of, of data or information. To the point, however, one of the things that's interesting is that we know when people are trying to remember speeches or remember things like that, they will often create a memory journey for themselves. So this is a kind of Renaissance trick. Hmm. You imagine yourself walking through a story in which you see different pieces in different parts and different places. Um, so story can be effective in, in that kind of way. If you're trying to remember something to tell somebody else, if you turn it into a story, your brain will generally recall that more effectively. Because again, your brain isn't built to operate like a computer. It has a hard time, at least most brains do, remembering lots of, of, of individual data points. I was taught as a journalist that people will remember what they feel more than what they actually learn, the numbers. Um, Kelly asks, oh, we're getting back to AI, taking your point that we're in the middle of an AI bubble, is there anything about the public's need for this story that keeps you up at night? You said no Skynet, <laughs> like no Matrix, but what yeah. about AI keeps you up at night? Well, there are a couple of things about AI that really concern me. Um, the first is that I think that a lot of people think that somehow something is going to come along and solve our problems for us. Hmm. And that makes me really nervous. I mean, I, I am made nervous by the fact that we're investing all this money in AI instead of investing money in children. So, I mean, AI and technology in general have just absorbed huge amounts of resources that we could be putting in other places. So, I mean, that's another thing that, that concerns me. And finally, I am concerned that the myth of AI and the myth of artificial intelligence is kind of recycling this myth that somehow logic is what kids need to learn or that technology, we need to see more of it in the classroom. I am dispirited by the amount of screens that are in classrooms. I am dispirited by the fact that so much of what happens, and I work in a lot of great school districts, is putting on a video and using it to teach kids something. We don't learn that much by watching a video. We don't learn that much through technology. Technology is a tool to make our lives easier. It is not a tool for learning. Learning takes struggle, learning takes work. And so to the extent that the AI bothers me, it bothers me that we're in this world that seems impatient with effort. It wants all its problems solved now and immediately. When those problems aren't solved, it likes to blame other people as though other people are the problem. It likes to complain. And you know the reality is, is that life is really hard and that we're here at our current state of opportunity because previous generations have sacrificed a ton to get us here and work is actually a joyful opportunity to give back and to grow and to learn so the whole idea that ai would somehow you know make life easier for all of us it's sort of a reflection of the fact that we built a lot of jobs that people don't like because they're industrial and then they wish that they could somehow get an ai machine to do all that work for them and then they somehow imagine that they will go vacation somewhere and be happy. When in reality, what makes you happy is the story of your life in which you have overcome obstacles and unlocked your potential and have a sense of satisfaction at, at being your fullest self. Our personal narrative. Bethany, though, asks, what do you think about the potential for computer models to predict human behavior and geopolitical actions? I wonder if the creative potential of people to act differently is so stifled by other factors that a model might actually have predictive value. Thoughts? Well, I think that's a brilliant observation. I, what I take you to be saying is the more that humans lose our, our abilities of imagination and the more we kind of behave the same as each other because we're kind of in this ultra logical place, the more that we can be predicted because we're actually acting like little miniature computers. I think to a certain extent that is true. But I will say that most people I talk to are frustrated and disaffected with the kind of either or binary paths that are being offered in most parts of life. I feel like a lot of us look at um, the world and feel like there's something in it that is not satisfying our sense of potential and possibility. So I think there's still a lot of fight left in humans, I guess I would say. I think that the possibility of ever designing. So back when I was in Hollywood, I actually worked on a script based on a Philip K. Dick novel. And it was called Variable Man. And the premise of this story 
is that computers have evolved to the point when they know so much about humans, they can predict everything we're going to do, at which point um, someone comes back from the past who is the variable man and kind of blows up the system. And that movie never got made. We gave it to a lot of people and they liked it until they realized that there was this kind of dark twist at the end, which I won't reveal. But the point is that there's always gonna be a variable in human behavior because that's how we evolved. Um, when I work with um, when I work with the military, I hear a lot of times that we're going to replace fighter pilots, for example, with AI. And what ends up happening there is if both countries are using AI to fly their planes, it works. But the moment you put a human in one of the cockpits, that human just does something bizarre. Why? <laughs> because they're not thinking totally logically, so they're not necessarily making the optimum move. And then that destabilizes the computer, and then the computer can't process fast enough. And then all of a sudden, the human is winning, not because the human is smarter, but if you remember that Simpsons episode where basically the enlightened humans are defeated with the aliens who have the stick. Oh, uh, yeah. Digging through it, right? You know, um, there's just this sense in which, you know, you can be the most enlightened, rational parent and you can't deal with your kids because they're not acting rationally themselves. So the moment you have that kind of volatility in the system, which is what humans are best at generating, I think that the models are going to break down. And I think if any of us are honest, we will say none of us have predicted most of the major events in the last three years that there have been continual shocks, you know, um, big ones, historical ones, and also in our own personal lives that we didn't see. Keeping on AI, and I'm skipping around a little bit, you talked about having an AI startup and someone asked, is there anything different about your AI startup that will allow it to avoid the fate you predict for the AI bubble? So the way our AI startup works, and this is, um, sort of built out of a project that I that, that sort of emerged uh, um, through sort of work in other industries is that it's based on AI human uh, interactions. And so the basic idea is uh, there are certain tasks which AI are better at, so big data tasks. There are certain tasks that humans are better at, low data tasks. So what if you could develop a system that was able to very quickly pass back and forth between these two? And that would allow you to do tasks much more fast than either an AI or a human could do it. The challenge with the startup has always been one of the fascinating things about AI is it doesn't know what it doesn't know. So AI has this big problem that it doesn't know when it's being incompetent. That's why if you ask ChatGPT um, some totally made up berserk question, you know, like, you know, um, why is it that Shakespeare assassinated Oscar Wilde? The chat GPT will say, so Shakespeare assassinated Oscar Wilde for the following 13 reasons. You know, it'll just make some because it doesn't know that it doesn't know. So the challenge has been like, how do you solve that part of the problem? And um, we, in a very kind of small, limited application, uh, have done something like that. So what makes it, I think, successful is that it's actually a cheat. And it's not really AI. It's actually AI and humans together. Can we talk a little, Adriana Melnick, once again, skipping around, asked about the practical applications of story thinking, um, especially to future visioning of solutions to address some of our big problems, for example, climate change. She writes, we seem unable to con collectively imagine the future implications of what we observe happening now. Any thoughts to that, Angus? about the power of story thinking and the applications to address some of our global issues? So I work a lot uh, with climate scientists. I also am sort of one of the original members of what's the big climate uh, project in Hollywood. And so this is a, a project which is very serious to me. What I wanna start out by saying though, is I don't think it's because people have a failure to imagine. I think it's because people, when they start to imagine it, get terrified and overwhelmed. And so I think a lot of the crisis you see in terms of climate is people being like, you know, so people who believe in climate change, which I think is actually most people, I think there's a myth that a lot of people deny climate change. I think most people actually believe that it's happening. But I think that people who want to stop climate change often panic because it's such a big problem and they don't exactly know what to do. And then this leads them to either, you know, give up or sort of finger point. And then people who resist climate change policies a lot of times there's a lot of fatalism in them. And they're like, you know what? I mean, I've got other really big problems in my life. 
And I think those other big problems actually seem more fixable than climate change. So I'm going to kind of focus on those. So I think a lot of it is actually that what has happened is that our brain is jumping forward to the very big consequences of climate change and not walking slowly through how do we fix this? How do we fix this? We're becoming impatient. And again, we're trying to rush to an answer. And so this is the main thing that we do again with kids is we try and have them slowly walk their stories forward. And this is the process of being a novelist. If you are a novelist or a screenwriter, you have to tell each step of the story in such a way that the whole story hangs together so that somebody else reading it gets it. And the main problem that most people have when they try and write their first novel or their first screenplay is they just skip huge things and they just compress a lot of stuff, you know? Or, um, you know, they can't figure out how to get the beginning and the end to kind of go together. And that process of slowly walking through every single bit of the plan, again, it's the same thing you do in business. That's what I think we need more of in climate change. I think it's less about the big consequences and more about helping people start to walk forward, do these things, do those things. And, you know, don't say that that's the end of the plan. Don't congratulate yourself. Hey, you know, we've done this. No, say, okay, where am I in my journey? Uh, where am I in my climb up the mountain? So I, I think a lot of it, honestly, just in my own personal experience is getting people to see the small steps and not be overwhelmed by the big jump. A uh, couple of questions here about how to become better at story thinking. Um, someone asked, would taking classes in creative writing, fiction or nonfiction and practicing writing or other creative arts in a deliberate way, can this help unlock the potential of story thinking? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why um, creative writers or people who have this kind of creative background often end up being visionary. So here's a, here's a fun thing I often like to tell people is the same parts of the brain that light up in a screenwriter are the same parts of the brain that light up in leaders because you're doing the same thing. You're imagining the future. So absolutely, that can work. Um, if people are interested, there's a free... Uh, guide to creative thinking that I, I wrote for the US Army. It's, it's public domain. You can find that on the internet. Uh, if you want to write me, I can, I, can, uh, I can send you a copy. So that's something simple you can do. Um, but yes, any, any creative story activity is going to help you build story thinking. What do we do? Oh my gosh, we're getting close to time here. There's so many questions. Thank you so much for all the questions, everyone. We're trying to get through as many of them as we can. What do we do about our human vulnerability to narratives that rely on false information? Henry asks, what do we do about the false information and those narratives? Is there anything we could do um, with that, Angus? Yeah, so no, and this is a great question. I get this all the time because this is obviously one of, we were talking about the low floor of, of narratives that, you know, narrative thinking allows you to do sort of zany things and it also makes you vulnerable. Um, the real key is, is what we often try and do is we often try and fight those narratives. And sometimes you can by giving the correct information, but it's actually generally more effective just to create more narratives. So what, 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 what we often find, and this is often the case in our kind of political landscape, is we often find like two stories just like locked against each other. Right, and, loggerhead. Right, yeah. And everybody kind of knows that neither story is really accurate, but they feel like the other story is more dangerous. So they spend all their time kind of attacking the foundation of it. And, and, and this just kind of produces this endless jam. In those situations, it's generally better to come up with new narratives that, are, that take on more facts, because the reason that humans evolved to use narrative is because narrative is useful. Not because it's right or true, but because it's useful. And the human brain is very, very fast at, de at determining when a story is useful to it. So you'll find this all the time. Like you'll pick up something and all of a sudden you'll be like, oh my goodness, I can use this. This is a great story. This is a great narrative. Or, or oh, the, I can learn so much from this person. They could help me make this plan or do this thing. Your brain is very good at that. And so what you want to be doing is you want to be giving people more of those stories that they recognize as useful. And in our current political landscape, stories are unfortunately useful because they give you admission into a tribe or something like that. Uh, and or stories are useful because, you know, for example, a lot of us don't like to acknowledge that we're wrong about something. We don't like to acknowledge because that the story that we have allows us to feel important and allows us to kind of maintain some sense of dignity. 
So what you want to do is you want to create an environment in which people realize, oh, actually, I get more out of acknowledging that I was wrong. I get more out of acknowledging that there was uh, more to this story. Because when you create that kind of an environment, then people actually want to let go of the bad story. So it's a little counterintuitive, but I generally say, don't worry about debunking stories. Instead, focus on giving people stories that empower them more. I'm going to try to fit in one last question before we kind of wrap up here, because I want to turn it to you to take the last word. But um, Jaron writes, how does story thinking help answer humans need for a happy ending or resolution? Meaning, if we want to keep asking questions, how do we find the energy to keep the infinite game going? Does it get Maybe. exhausting? No, this is another great question. Well, so unfortunately we are in an infinite game. I mean, this is just something that has to be said about life is, is we are just born into an endless struggle. But I think that each of us has our opportunity to declare our own victory. This is something that actually uh, was driven home to me when I started working with soldiers who were coming back from Afghanistan. Um, so I worked with a lot of soldiers, I worked with a lot of nurses who came back from Afghanistan. And you know that was a 20 year war that we lost. And we lost it in a fashion that basically not only kind of gave up everything that we had had uh, had had done, but but also betrayed a lot of the people who we built relationships with, and 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 had betrayed uh, uh, a lot of a lot of our colleagues and allies. And so, what we do is we work with people to declare your own victory. I mean, there's always more in your life that you want to accomplish. There's always that that extra book that you want to write. There's always that extra trip you want to take. There's always kind of things. But um, at some point in your life, saying okay. I have enough, and then shifting your psychology, as I talk about in the last chapter of the book, from story thinking to story giving. And maybe this would be a good place for me to, to, to end, because even though the entire book is about story thinking and about your own story, ultimately what we as humans gain the most lasting satisfaction from is helping other people live their stories. This is why we have so much satisfaction with children, this is why teachers, have such high satisfaction. This is why mentors have such high satisfaction is empowering other people to tell their stories, to live their stories, to think their own plans for the future. And so what I would say is if you want to kind of escape from the endless, you know, cycle of, of competition and clash, and, you know, there's always this new story out there, there's always this new thing, focus your energies on that. Focus your energies on identifying what's unique about the people in your life. Focus your energies on identifying the unique stories that they have inside them. Focus your energies on helping them live those stories. That is story giving. And we just know biologically, that is the most satisfying activity that a human can engage in. And that is also ensuring that you're going to live on into the story of the future in lives beyond your own. I think that's a perfect way, Angus, to close this fascinating conversation. Wow, what a journey we've been on for the last 90 minutes. I am so sorry. We, there were so many great questions in there, and I'm sorry that we couldn't get through all of them. Um, but I will say the conversation can keep going. I have read Story Thinking. I very greatly enjoyed it filled with narratives. Um, as a lit major, I myself enjoyed it very much. Um, I do need to mention that uh, a recording of the session will be made available within 24 hours on our YouTube channel. Uh, we will be emailing you a link to all that. And I think Canvas also mentioned there will be information about this book. Um, Angus, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, thank you so much for the great conversation, for the questions that came up. There is truly interest in this. And I think this conversation was just sort of, at least for me, the tip of the iceberg. So I plan to delve into this um, a little bit more. So I think that we are going to be uh, closing out. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for this wonderful discussion. And we'll see you all the next time.